Morning everyone, it's Ross Anderson here from the Australian and New Zealand Boutique Wine Show with episode number 15 of Meet the Boutique Winemakers and this is still the trophy edition. Now um, we ran the Australian and New Zealand Boutique Wine Show at the start of November and considering the year that we've had with uh, the challenges of COVID in 2020, we managed to have an amazing uptake in entries, more than 900 uh, small winemakers and small wine entries from across Australia and New Zealand were in this year's show. So we were delighted with that outcome. Uh, the Australian and New Zealand Boutique Wine Show is celebrating 25 years of supporting the small winemakers of Australia and New Zealand. The aim of these interviews is to inform you, educate you and entertain you on all things boutique and to share the stories and the personalities behind the brands, which are the heartbeat of Australian and New Zealand wine. Now on to today's uh, interview. Uh, Heathcote in Victoria is synonymous with uh, Shiraz, and it's always high on my list when I'm looking for a really tasty Shiraz. Uh, Tellurian Wines and Tellurian Estate has been making quality wine since 2008, but there's more to the story than just Shiraz, as we'll find out shortly. I'm joined from Heathcote by senior winemaker Tobias Anstead. Morning, Tobias. How are you? Yeah, good. Thanks, Ross. Yeah, great. Are you well? Yeah, very well. very well. Good, 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 good. Thank you to thanks for taking time out of your busy day to have a quick chat with us. How are things down in your beautiful part of the world? Well, at the moment things are looking fantastic. We've actually um, had a really nice spring, some uh, some nice rain through winter and spring, and some warm days. And the vineyard is looking uh, fantastic. And so that's for us at the moment. That's probably the the priority is the vineyard. And um, so no, it's it's the season's looking fantastic so far. We won't count any chickens but um yeah no at the moment everything's looking good I'm looking good and, and Tobias did you use the this lockdown time this uh, this middle of the year to do anything new at the estate I mean you wouldn't have had visitors so uh, did you use that time to do something else well in fact we um the probably the biggest thing that's happened for us this year is our new cellar door we had uh started construction about a year ago and um were set to open just sort of as COVID hit and so we we kind of didn't get to have the grand opening that we were hoping for, unfortunately. But since uh, uh, lockdown has ended, we've certainly been very happy to welcome uh, people to the to the new cellar door and uh, take full advantage of that. Is, it, is that something like would have happened in the last few weeks, or did it happen in the last few months? Yeah. I mean, the, the the restrictions in Melbourne. Yeah, it's um, it's really. I mean, the lockdown in Central Victoria, where we are, sort of ended. Um, well, it never really got as, as severe as it was in Melbourne, but that we've been open for a number of weeks there. But yeah, it's only since Melbourne kind of lo ended lockdown about three weeks ago, I think it is, that, that we sort of really have seen uh, visitors in any sort of numbers. That's fantastic. And, and on the visitors thing, um, is consumer confidence returning? Do you, do you feel that that confidence is coming back and there's interest in tourism and getting out to the regional areas? Oh, definitely. I think people have... I think uh, people have been going stir crazy uh, in Melbourne, and I think uh, there's, there's definitely an appetite to get out and about and to, to visit the regions. Yeah, I was seeing that a lot of that. Fantastic, fantastic. Well, let's talk about the the the, the, the diamond of of this quick show. Um, Tellurian Nero uh, 2019 uh, picked up trophy in the. Um, in the ANZ Boutique Wine Show. Congratulations to, to you and the team for this amazing achievement. But everyone wants to know, tell us a bit about Nero Davola. Yeah, so it's a, look, it's a variety that I think um, is probably, um, people probably starting to hear about, may have seen one or two here and there, but it's definitely a variety that's relatively new in Australia and um, in Heathcote. Uh, you know, it comes from Sicily, so obviously a pretty warm part of Italy. And, we planted it here in 2011, um, you know, looking at varieties that we could plant that would um, do well in this uh, kind of warm, dry climate that we've got. Um, not really knowing, I mean, we tasted a few, but not really knowing whether or not it was going to work. Um, but yeah, we've certainly, since we've, uh, we started making it in 2013 and it's a fantastic variety. It really does well in this region and produce really lovely wines. And so, Tobus, uh, Tobias, if I'm at the um, cellar door and someone's pouring this wine into my glass, what are the flavour descriptors that you would use to to tell people about this wine? What can they look for? Yeah, we see it has that really lovely lifted sort of 
red fruits, a um, little bit of spice, a little bit of licorice sometimes, but it's really that sort of fruit driven kind of uh, aspect that we look for and that we focus on. Um, we make it to be kind of a, a fruit driven style. We're not looking for oak complexity or those sorts of things. Um, has lovely sort of soft tannins and really nice balanced acidity. And that's one of the reasons why we, we grow it and make it is because it, it does well here and keeps really lovely natural acidity and, and freshness. Fantastic. Um, tell us a bit about you. You've got a very interesting background uh, and, and journey in wine, which is really fascinating. Um, you've got some uh, interesting international experience uh, in Romania and in Argentina and in France. Um, tell us a bit about your journey in wine to date. Yeah, so I, I guess I was one of those weird people who kind of left school and went straight into the wine industry, not having any background in it. My parents weren't particular wine drinkers. They didn't own a winery. Um, and it was kind of on a suggestion of a family friend. I kind of got to the end of year 12 and didn't really have much idea what I was going to do. And they suggested that I should look at a viticulture course that was being offered at, uh, in South Australia at Roseworthy. Um, and so I went out and got some work experience at a, a small winery and vineyard in Canberra where I grew up. And yeah, they, it was a great experience. And I, uh, they actually offered me work. And so I, I, at the end of year 12, took a year off and, and worked with them and got a job working in a wine shop at the same time and just loved it. And so went on to study, um, got a degree. Then at, at the time, which was the mid nineties, uh, there was huge opportunities for young winemakers to travel and, and make wine around the world. So I kind of took advantage of that. And yeah, as I said, made wine in Romania, Argentina and France. The Romanian thing sounds really interesting. Um, they must be doing some, some alternate gear over on that part of the world. Um, and then you returned to Australia and um, you worked a couple of places before hopping into and working with Tellurian. Yeah, so I came back um, and initially I worked, the first place I worked when I came back was a, a winery in Cowra in central New South Wales. Um, was there for two vintages before looking for another opportunity and went overseas again and did another vintage in France and came back and actually took up a job in, uh, in Bendigo in central Victoria for Galgania Estate, which is one of the sort of the, the um, pioneering wineries of the, the sort of the boutique winemakers in central Victoria and Victoria in general, I guess, um, and was there for eight years. And it was there that I met Ian, who is the owner of Tellurian. Yep. Excellent. And then uh, I guess they say the rest is history. I think you, you joined in 2006 on a contractual basis and then by 2008 you'd fallen in love with the property and took it up full time. Yeah, so I, I initially approached in 2006 by Ian and we made a, a small amount of wine in 2007 while I was at Balgania, then 2008 was our sort of first proper vintage and uh, again, yeah, as you say, it's all, since then it's, uh, it's all history since then. It's water under the bridge, absolutely. <laughs> um, whilst we're talking all things wine, I'm quite keen to, to explore the whole range or, uh, or at least the range that was in, in this year's show. Um, I'm going to pop up on the screen the uh, GSM. Can you tell us a bit about uh, this wine in particular? Yeah, so we, I guess, Shiraz, being in Heathcote, and Heathcote's synonymous with Shiraz, uh, you know, Shiraz has definitely been our focus. Um, but from quite early on, we were looking at what other varieties might do well in the region. And I guess our first stop on that sort of uh, journey was looking at where does Shiraz come from? What else is grown in that sort of part of the world? And, and so Grenache and, and other varieties were kind of the first that came to mind. So we actually made our first GSM in 2010. Um, and as far as we know, it was the first uh, GSM in Heathcote at the time. Um, and yeah, we've, we think this is a, a fantastic blend and, and varieties that have a huge uh, potential in the Heathcote region. Um, so we've, we've been making it for a while and, and we are definitely heavy promoters of this style. And um, I think we're starting to see more and more people in this region look at these varieties and start to uh, explore the possibilities with them. Yeah, I think GSM is something that um, it just offers amazing value for money irrespective of where it is in the country. So, yeah, absolutely top of the list uh, when it comes to those red blends. I just want to go back into a bit of the history behind Tellurian. Um, it was set up in 2002, but do you know what the what the site was prior to 2002? Uh, so this this whole area is kind of broadacre farming with some grazing. So there's, you know, we've got a lot of uh, wheat and sheep farmers in this area. Um, so this was a, 
Um, this particular part would have been a combination that it kind of covers a fair bit of different sort of terrain up on the higher slopes, not really um, good for, uh, for broad acre, but definitely sheep farming. Um, but yeah, I suppose there's a, a fair bit of vineyard development took place in this part of the world in the, in the 90s and 2000s with people recognising the quality of uh, the soil, particularly for growing grapes. And what would you say would be the highlights reel um, of Tellurian? Uh, let, let's take it from, from your tenure there. So say from 2006 to today, what would, you, what would that highlights reel look like? Well, look, it's, a, it's an ongoing journey. And I think, you know, as I said before, that um, Shiraz is really the, the variety that got us to the region and the reason why Ian planted the vineyard. Um, but since then, you know, we've, we have been exploring other varieties and, and um, I think those Southern Rhone varieties of Grenache and Mourvedre and we've recently planted some Carignan and Grenache Gris, they're definitely varieties that have a big future here. Um, but I think, you know, Shiraz is definitely the kind of the main focus of, of our business and also what the region is known for, um, but with some, some bit of uh, other things sprinkled in there for interest. And on the flip side of the highlights reel, tell us about the challenges that um, you face in that region or specifically at Tellurian. Yeah, well, like I think this is common to probably all regions of, uh, of Australia. Um, a changing climate is definitely presenting challenges. I think that um, you know things are definitely getting warmer and drier, and that means that the way we grow grapes and the, the sort of wines that we make uh, are changing, and we need to adapt. And I think part of that adaption is is in the vineyard doing things differently, but it's also looking at new varieties. And you know, a classic Nero Davila is a is a classic example of that, I suppose, of, of finding new varieties that are going to do well in a in a hotter, drier climate. And whilst we're talking about narrow and, and alternative varieties, and I'm going to come back to that in a sec, let's talk about the elephant in the room, um, Shiraz. Let's talk about all things Shiraz. You make a number of Shirazes. I'm going to pop them up on the screen. Could you maybe uh, tell us a little bit about the, the differences between uh, these three wines in particular? We've got the, uh, the pastiche uh, Shiraz, and then we've got the, uh, the red line, and we've got the Tranta. So um, tell us a bit about the wines and the differences between the three. Yeah, so our red line Shiraz is kind of our entry level wine. It's made in a, a kind of a, a fruit forward, fairly generous style, but with soft tannin. No, not looking for any kind of oak influence. Something that's you know just soft and enjoyable um, as a as a young uh, young wine. Pastiche, I guess, steps up in terms of complexity and seriousness. A little bit more structure. We we go for a little bit more spice and interest there with some whole bunch um, and a little bit of oak influence. Um, but then nothing again that's going to dominate the wine um, and something that can be enjoyed immediately, but also will, will benefit from a little bit of cellaring. Uh, and then the Tranta Shiraz, I guess, is our flagship Shiraz. It's the wine that we kind of started out making. Um, and that's really a wine, I guess, that we're looking for depth, complexity and uh, longevity. So we make it as a wine with more structure, um, more tannin um, and as a wine that can develop and, and evolve over time. And is there any um, significance in the names, Red Line, Pastiche and Tranta? Do they have a meaning or a connection to someone on the land or part of land? Or Yeah, so Red Line is, is a reference to the fact that the, the, the soil that we have here is a, is a Cambrian derived red soil. It's got a lot of iron in it that provides the red. And it's, it's basically in a long strip or line that runs north to south in the region, a bit like the Coonawarra, Terrarossa sort of thing where it's, it's a very narrow, it's, it's a particular range of um, rock that has weathered to produce the soil, and that's where the red line name comes from. Pastiche name is, um, comes from the fact that when we first made that wine, it was a blend of fruit from different vineyards. It wasn't all our own fruit, and it was kind of the idea was that it was a, a bit of a blend of um, different fruit from different vineyards in a, maybe in a not quite so serious style that the, that the Tranta was. Um, and Tranta is a, is a reference to the name of the people who own this sort of property before we did. So it, the Tranta name, is, we, we are on Tranta Road and the Tranta family owned a lot of the land in this area. Right, understood. That makes sense. Um, so just before we were talking about Shiraz, as we were talking about the viability uh, of um, alternate and emerging varieties, 
Um, no, as we've just seen there, you make some great Shirazes as the anchor, but you also work with the Rhone varieties. So Grenache, Mouvedre, Carignan, Grenache Gris, Marsan, Roussan, Viognier, and then the Italians, uh, Nero d'Avola and Fiano. Where do you think the future lies in Australia for these emerging and alternate varieties? Oh, look, I think, to be honest, I think we've kind of only really seen the tip of the iceberg when it comes to new varieties. I think that, um, you know, in an effort to kind of to adapt to a changing climate, to a drier climate, to a warmer climate, we have to look elsewhere. I think that the, the traditional varieties will continue to do well in certain areas, but there's no doubt that there are areas now which, um, you know, that, that, that the traditional varieties are not going to do as well as they have done, and we need to find new ones. And I think what, you know, we, we've gone for some of the kind of more obvious ones, I guess, in things like Grenache and Mourvedre, they're, they're already reasonably well known, but I think we're going to start to see many more of these sort of lesser known varieties like Fiano or Nero d'Avola um, as we explore what works and, and what works in, in different parts of the, the country. So. It's interesting because we were talking to um, uh, Larry Handolf-Hill and uh, Judy at Artwine uh, yesterday, uh, and Judy in particular is growing, uh, they pretty much specialise in alternate varieties. You hardly see a traditional variety, whereas Larry in the Hills um, has championed uh, the Austrian alternate varieties like Gruner Veltliner. Um, in Heathcote, um, is this site particularly well suited to some of or most of these varieties in your opinion? Oh, look, Heathcote in general or our particular vineyard? Heathcote in general. Yeah, look, I mean, Heathcote's actually quite a diverse region. It's it's a long, narrow region, um, and it sort of in the south, it's both higher altitude, slightly different soil type, um, and obviously further south, as you head north, the altitude drops and um, things get warmer. So it's, it's quite a diverse region, and what works sort of in the south isn't necessarily what's going to work in the north, but I definitely see we're, we're almost right in the middle um, and definitely in the, from where we are sort of in the middle further north I definitely see a huge potential for some of these varieties that have come from the warmer parts of Europe um, and you know, are better at um, handling the heat and also requiring less water which is going to become more and more of an issue. And, and you mentioned or you alluded to it earlier on when we we're talking about the red line the, the Cambrian soil of Heathcote. Um, is there anything else that uh, that combines with that soil to make Heathcote such a, a fruit bowl for growing amazing good quality fruit year in and year out? Is it is it purely the soil or is it uh, other factors like altitude, um, uh, elevation? Uh, what, what do you think makes that perfect combination? Well, the soil is a big factor because it's, it's kind of, um, it provides a perfect environment for grapevines in that it's, it's relatively friable and, and the vines can get their roots into it relatively easily, but it also is good at holding moisture, which is you know, not often the, the combination you get. Sometimes you get sandy soils that are great at, for roots, but not so good at holding moisture, or you get clay soils that are heavy, but roots find it hard to get in. So the soil is definitely a big part of it. But I think also the climate, you know, I think that the dry climate is a, both a blessing and a curse. It means that, for example, things like disease pressure are very low. We don't have um, a lot of disease pressure, which is you know, one of the reasons why we've, we've converted now to organic uh, practices. And, you know, I think it's, it's been relatively straightforward in that disease, the, the biggest issue is disease pressure. And for us, that's with the, with the dry climate is um, relatively low. So it's meant that we've been able to move away from sort of fungicides and things that uh, other regions might find more challenging. And is the move to um, the organic, which you've got on the back label here, I noticed, is that something fairly recent or was that in the planning for a certain amount of years and finally you just achieved that status? Yeah, so well, you have to go through a three-year conversion process and so it took us three years to get there, but uh, 2019 actually was our first fully organic vintage. Um, so, yeah, it's only relatively recent that we've uh, got the certification for that. Um, just for the people that don't understand the whole process, what does that actually mean? What's the difference between an organic practice and uh, and a general practice, for want of a better word? Yeah, so organic yeah, is really, I guess, it's kind of about what you can't use. I guess I would say that you know, organics is more about what you can't do than what you can do. And it really just says that yeah. you, you, know, you can't use synthetic chemicals, you can't use um, pesticides and herbicides, 
um, and fungicides. Um, so yeah, it basically restricts what you're able to use in the vineyard. And that just means that you have to change your practice. It means that um, you know, using um, less harmful chemicals in the vineyard and it's meant for us with weed control, for example, that we now use mechanical weed control rather than chemical weed control. Um, and that has other benefits. I mean, it's not just the reduction in the use of chemicals, which I think in itself is a, is a good thing, but it's also means improvement in the soil and the soil structure. So we're starting to get much more life back into our soils now. You know, we, have, um, we don't have this sort of neat strip of, uh, of uh, undervine where there's nothing growing and nothing living. It's all, you know, it looks a bit messy, I suppose, but it means that there's actually plants growing there. There's roots in the soil there that the, the fungi and bacteria can live on and that brings things like worms and that just generally improves the soil structure as well. Yeah. So th there's lots of benefits to it beyond just the reduction in chemicals. And I guess it might see an increase in the bottom line costs initially, but that all evens out over the over the term. And you just adapt it into your practices. Is that would that be accurate? Yeah. So there is some. I mean, obviously, it, for example, there are some things that are very cheap and quick, and like herbicide use. Um, it's very you know an easy way of controlling the weeds. Um, and mechanical weed control is is more expensive in time and, and effort. Um, but I guess we we really undertook this um, process to based on sort of trying to improve fruit quality first, and that's what it's kind of ultimately about. So, yeah, I, I think that we accept that there's a cost, but the benefit hopefully is over time we see improvements in fruit quality and wine quality. Let's talk about another wine that you make. Uh, we, we touched on the alternate variety. Let's have a look at this Fiano. What can you tell us about this? We, we've gone about face today. We've run the reds first and the whites afterwards, but uh, let, let's have a look at the Fiano. Yeah. Tell us a bit about it. Yeah, so Fiano is another variety, I guess. We planted uh, it's similar time to um, Nero Davila. Um, and again, it was looking for a, a variety that was an alternative to the sort of more traditional varieties that we wanted, we thought could do well. And Fiano um, definitely, you know, like Nero, it's, it, doesn't mind a bit of warmth, it doesn't mind the dry so much, and it, it holds onto its acidity really well. In terms of the, the, the variety itself, I kind of think of it as almost like warm climate Chardonnay in that it can be made into a variety of different styles. It can be picked a bit earlier and made into a sort of fairly crisp, fresh sort of style. It can be picked a bit riper and made into a more full-bodied style with barrel fermentation, lees work. Um, and so, yeah, it's a very kind of adaptable um, variety. And so, yeah, I think it's uh, another one that's you know, a bit of a punt, but has turned out to be a, a very good variety for our region. Tobias, can you share any of your future plans or potential future plans at Tellurian? Um, anything that's in the wings that you're able to tell us about? Yeah, so I guess one thing that we probably, we've been working on for a while, but kind of hasn't really hit the market yet is we have a small, close plant the vineyard of Shiraz, and there's a there's a photo actually one of the photos that you put up earlier shows that vineyard right at the top of our vineyard and that um that's been a really interesting project to just have a look at what that the one? effect that that's the one there yeah um to look at what the effects of that close planting are and trying to we went with shiraz because we wanted to kind of find a different expression for of shiraz from our own site and from the first few vintages of that we've definitely seen that there's there are differences it's a it's a kind of more protected site it's a bit higher altitude and it makes a wine that's a little bit more, has a bit more finesse, I guess. Um, you know, Heathcote Shiraz is generally quite full bodied and, and relatively rich. And the, the wines from that site are definitely have a little bit more um, finesse about them. Um, and the other one that I guess we've probably been just working on in the, the last couple of years is we're planting more Grenache, but as bush vines as opposed to trellis vines. And so we're hoping that that, uh, going back to the future, I think, in. Uh, hoping that that's, uh, <laughs> it's true. It's very true. <laughs> yeah, it's it's definitely more work. It's labour intensive, but um, yeah, we're hoping that the benefits pay off in terms of wine quality. It, it sounds like a really busy uh, environment down there. New cellar door, uh, that new plantation. When when are you expecting that uh, Shiraz to come online? Uh, the the Grenache. No, the Shiraz, the, that new vineyard you've planted of Shiraz you were just oh, mentioning. When you... oh, so, yeah, we, we have actually made a couple of vintages of that and we just haven't, the wines haven't been officially released yet. So we've got from starting from 2017, we have, um, we have wine, made wine from that vineyard. Um, mm -hmm. But yes, yeah, just not uh, officially released. 
Okay, excellent. And, and tell us now, um, if you weren't in wine, where do you think your career may have taken you? Oh gosh, that's a hard hard thing to to know. I think um, probably the thing that I really, if if I if I had the aptitude for it, um, the, the thing I think probably would like to be in would be uh, some sort of musical endeavour. But unfortunately, I don't have the uh, the ability. Uh, <laughs> yeah. But yeah, I think that's probably the other thing that I sort of think would be um, would have been nice. Do you want to elaborate on that? What, what kind of musical endeavour would it have included an instrument of some sort? Oh, look, I, I mean, was, yeah, it's, I, I have a, uh, a broad taste when it comes to music. I think um, anything from uh, kind of classical jazz uh, to kind of R&B and, and, and pop, a bit of country, a bit of folk, you know, I, anything really. I just, I think it's just a, a wonderful thing to, uh, would be a wonderful thing to be involved in, but um, yeah, unfortunately, uh, never showed the aptitude that was required to achieve much in that regard. Right, fair enough. Well, well I think we share we share that. I, in my other life, I would have been a, a guitarist in a, in a hard rock band somewhere touring the world. But it's it's a good thing that hasn't happened this year with all the all the stuff that's going on. Because uh, I'm hearing there's a, there's a world of pain out there for those guys. Um, Tobias, tell us about your favourite wine memory. It doesn't have to be a Tellurian memory. Is there a memory of wine that um, that comes to mind? Yeah, probably an experience that I had that um, kind of sticks with me a little bit was I um, part of the Melbourne Food and Wine Festival probably 25 years ago now. Or, yeah, probably 25 years ago. There was a tasting put on of Shadowy Chem that was put on with uh, the, the, the at-time owner of uh, Shadowy Chem, Comp uh, de Lourdes Salus, and he had brought wines from his own cellar across for a tasting that was hosted by himself and James Halliday. And I can't... You know, I can't remember exactly, but it was about two hundred dollars a head, and you know, having brought wines from sort of from the 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 fifties, sixties, and right through to sort of more recent vintage. I think nineteen ninety was a kind of the, the wine that was the most recent, and it was an incredible tasting, amazing. And uh, I was very happy with the, the the money that I'd spent as a as a student. Um, you know, it was quite a bit of money. But it was uh, at the end of the tasting, the, the count said, well, you know, I, I brought these wines from my own cellar. They didn't cost me anything. So we're going to uh, give you your money back and you can, uh, you can, you know, I'm, I'm donating the wine. And that was kind of a, it sticks in my mind as a, both a memorable tasting, but also as a, an incredibly generous kind of Absolutely. Um, you know, gesture. And have you ever been tempted to, to um, steer Tellurian into a, a dessert style wine? Uh, like a, a a sweet wine, a, a Botrytis style wine, or something like that. Well, Botrytis is tricky because, I think I said before, that the, the climate's not really conducive to to fungal disease, and fungal disease is kind of what you mean uh, yeah. part of the description for for Botrytis style wines. We have um, played around with sweet wine, but at this stage, I think you know the reality is the market's fairly small, um, and so look, it's something that we may do at some point, but. We have so many other things going on in terms of wines and, yeah, and new wines. Very busy. Tobias, let's put a wrap on uh, this uh, interview. Uh, where can we buy the wine? So we've got the website on the bottom at tellurianwines.com.au. Uh, you've got the social handles at Tellurian Wines and Tellurian Wines Heathcote. Uh, if people go to the website, is there, um, is there a club they can join up to, a members club? There sure is, yeah. We've got, yep, we have um, a wine shop, and um, there's an opportunity to join our wine club there, and that gives you information about all of the all the aspects of the uh, the winery and vineyard, and what we do, and the wines that we make. Perfect, excellent. That sounds like something that everyone should be doing. Um, I'm going to let you get on with the rest of your day. Thank you so much for your time. Um, can you just don't don't hang up on the line uh, whilst I put a wrap on the show? Thanks, Tobias, for joining us. Yeah, no problem at all. Thanks, Ross. All right, everyone, that's it for this edition. Uh, be sure to jump onto the website at tellurianwines.com.au. Get onto Facebook and Instagram. Make sure you tag and follow these guys. They are making amazing wines. Um, as I keep saying, get onto the site, put a mixed dozen together for Christmas. Um, Melbourne's open, Victoria's open. Uh, the country is slowly opening up. Uh, get these wines into your house for Christmas. It's going to be pretty busy. We're at the start of December, so... Bear in mind freight uh, interstate uh, and the, the sheer weight of parcels being carried by couriers. So get your orders in early. 
And uh, that's it. Uh, thank you for joining us. Thanks for tuning in. Plenty more videos to come in the next few days. So stay tuned. And until next time, stay safe.